advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, the UCC Financing Statement When Collateral is Held in a Trust. My name is Caitlin Alberta, and I will be your moderator. Joining us today is Paul Holdenfield. Paul is Associate General Counsel for CSC, where he is responsible for advising the company regarding real estate recording, notary, uniform, commercial code, and other public record transaction services. And with that, let's welcome Paul. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, in my uh, role uh, at uh, CSC as the, uh, I guess, the subject matter resource for all things related to UCC uh, search and filing. One uh, of the areas that um, I, I get a lot of questions about from both internally and a lot from our, our customers as well uh, is the uh, filing uh, and preparation of a financing statement when the collateral is held in a trust. And there, there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, you know, dealing with trusts uh, as debtors uh, poses some challenges for legal professionals and, and lenders alike and uh, can be uh, somewhat confusing as to what is really required and uh, there's sometimes a tendency to overthink how the uh, how the financing statement should be prepared so what I'm going to do today uh, is uh, give you some idea of how to deal with this and and some of the challenges that uh, filers run into include, um, and, and this is a big one, when it comes to trust-related collateral and preparing the financing statement, uh, the, the process isn't really intuitive. Um, in some cases, for example, the, the name of the debtor required for a financing statement is different from the actual name of the debtor. Uh, the location of the debtor may be uh, different than one would expect intuitively. But these rules do tend to make sense when, uh, when viewed um, as a whole. So uh, those are some things that uh, I'll be covering today. Um, there's also a temptation to in impute other types of law to uh, trust-related UCC financing statements. For example, uh, real estate law or other, other types of law where um, you know, a contract or, as I said, real estate, where the form of the name used for the trust may be different uh, than that required by the UCC. And there's also sometimes a, a temptation to overcomplicate the UCC records when the collateral is held in a trust, um, uh, you know, to, to think that it's, it, you know, more information is required than what Article 9 really says. Uh, so we do see in the name fields uh, frequently uh, extra information inserted in there regarding trusts. Uh, sometimes the entire history of the trust we'll find in a name field. And uh, really uh, focusing, I, I think, sometimes on uh, information or data that really isn't all that relevant to the filing process, or at least to certain aspects of it. So all of these are things that I'm going to take a look at today and, and point out um, uh, you know, the, what is required and uh, uh, just as importantly, uh, what kinds of errors that are commonly made in this process. And the way I'm going to do it today is I'm going to start out going through some essential UCC concepts that it's important to understand in any uh, filing discussion about Article 9. Then I'll move on and talk about the debtor name, uh, the, the other filing requirements, such as distinguishing information in some cases for uh, certain trusts, uh, the debtor mailing address when the collateral is held in a trust, and where to file when the collateral is held in a trust. And at the very end, um, hopefully there will be some time for Q&A, and if not, we'll, uh, uh, you, you can submit your uh, questions by the uh, Q&A widget, and uh, we'll capture them all and, and af uh, answer those we can't get to during the presentation. Uh, offline afterwards. So let's go ahead and start with some essential concepts of the UCC. One of the most important things to remember is that the UCC is a notice filing system. Uh, that means that uh, what gets filed in the UCC records are notices, uh, a mere notice that a security interest may exist. 
the UCC record is not an operative document or an enforceable document. Nobody can sue to enforce a UCC financing statement. Rather, they're just notices to alert interested parties that a security interest may exist. And this has an impact on um, uh, you know, the contents of records uh, and what gets filed and how they get searched. Now, as mere notices, UCC records don't provide a lot of detailed information. Uh, they're uh, really just enough to alert somebody that a security interest may exist, so they don't contain dollar amounts, terms and conditions, uh, things like that. Uh, and uh, in the case of trust-related financing statements, they, they may not provide all the details regarding the, uh, the trusts, uh, the trustees, and things like that. But uh, we'll get back to exactly what is required um, you know, as we move through the presentation. Because the, uh, the UCC doesn't uh, require financing statements to provide all the details of the transaction, that means interested parties, in other words, those who search the records, uh, are expected to look beyond the public record uh, for the full state of affairs. They're not in, entitled to rely solely on the contents of the public record. Uh, some other uh, essential concepts is that there are multiple types of trusts, and uh, the depending on the type of trust, uh, there could be different rules that apply to debtor name requirements, to um, uh, filing location, and, and things like that. Um, the, one type of a trust is the registered organization trust. This is this was. Um, uh, this came about in the 2010 amendments to Article 9 because the uh, uh, there was some question over uh, whether trusts such as the uh, Massachusetts Business Trust and uh, similar laws in many other states, similar organizations, uh, fell within registered organization name rules rather than the trust rules. And the 2010 amendments clarified that they are indeed registered organizations. And so they're treated as a registered organization for the filing location, in other words, where the debtor is located, for the uh, debtor name sufficiency and, uh, and other purposes. They're the exact same as a, uh, uh, an LLC or a corporation. And then the other uh, the other type of trust would be the common law, or tes uh, in, which would include a testamentary trust. They're treated the same, and with these types of trusts, they're uh, created uh, uh, you know, through a trust agreement. There's no public record filing required, uh, and these are governed by different laws. The type of debtor, um, it's not the organization. Necessarily, it can be the tr it's typically the trustee, but depending on the law of certain states, it could be the trust itself that's the actual debtor. Uh, the location of the debtor uh, is typically going to be the location of the trustee, or if the trust is the actual debtor, uh, then the location of the trust. And uh, the debtor name sufficiency for these types of uh, trusts is determined under a different section than that applicable to registered organization trust rules. So when dealing with uh, trusts as debtors and, pre and uh, preparing to file a financing statement, there's some initial determinations that have to be made. First is, who's the debtor? Is it a registered organization? Is it the trustee of a common law or testamentary trust? Or is it, uh, under the law of the applicable state, the trust itself? That's an initial determination that has to be made because that can affect the name that's required, and it can affect the uh, filing location. Uh, it's also necessary to determine the debtor name for purposes of the financing statement. To do this requires access to the uh, uh, organic record of the trust. It's necessary to determine the filing location. Um, and that's typically going to be in the location of the debtor unless uh, we're dealing with uh, real estate-related collateral. But assuming it's uh, uh, not real estate-related collateral, like fixtures, timber to be cut, minerals to be extracted, then the records would be filed in the central filing office of the state where the law governs perfection and priority. And that governing law is determined by the location of the debtor, and uh, the location will be determined under the standard rules of 9307 that are applicable to the type of debtor. That's why it's important to determine whether the uh, trust is a registered organization or if the debtor is a trust or the trustee. 
Now, the starting point for any due diligence related to trusts is always going to be the organic record of the trust. And that's because Article 9 requires, uh, for one thing, it requires the name on the organic record uh, if a name is specified. And uh, without the organic record, the filer isn't going to know what name is required. Now, the organic record may go by, uh, may be called different things depending on common usage in a particular jurisdiction. Sometimes it's called a declaration of trust. It might be called a trust agreement. It could be called something else. Uh, certainly, the last will and testament can can uh, create a trust as as well. But uh, know the terminology in the particular jurisdiction. But whatever that record is that creates the trust. Now, review of this record is essential because without it, uh, the part uh, the, the secured party simply can't determine what name is required uh, for filing purposes. It's just simply. Uh, it, you, you can't determine it without looking at the language of the trust uh, organic record. Now, I know there are some challenges in getting access to the trust's organic record, and, and there may be uh, uh, more than one state where it, 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 the, uh, uh, a lender might not even get be able to get access to it by law. So uh, it can be a challenge in some cases, but be aware that this is, uh, uh, this is really the only uh, sufficient source document. This is where uh, the, the process really needs to start. Now, in addition to getting uh, uh, access to the organic record of the trust, there's some other steps involved. You know, identify the name of the trust, whether the organic record specifies the name of the trust, uh, or if no name is specified, or if it's not clear whether it's specified. Uh, it's necessary to identify the, the settlor, the, the person or entity that created the trust, and um, identify any of the current trustees, especially if uh, the trustees are the, uh, are the debtors, uh, the, the, the people that have uh, legal title to the collateral that's held in the trust. So those are the starting, uh, you know, those are the initial uh, or the essential concepts and the initial due diligence process. Now I want to move on and talk about probably the most important part of the filing process when the debtor is, uh, or when the collateral is held in a trust. Um, and again, t I, my focus today is on the common law trusts, not on registered organization trusts. But the most important thing is by far the debtor name. Uh, it is critical to get the debtor name right for purposes of the financing statement, because if it's not right, uh, the secured party can find itself unperfected, and that can be just as bad as being unsecured. Now, why are, why are debtor names so important here uh, with trusts? Uh, because there's a, a real challenge as to how to provide them. There's a temptation to provide them many different ways. Uh, we see them provided many different ways. For example, here are five different examples of financing statements filed against the same trust. Um, one of these names is likely correct without access to the organic record. It's going to be very hard to tell. But um, we can tell that some of these are, uh, and probably at least three out of the four of these, and maybe uh, or three out of the five here, are going to be seriously misleading and not effective. Um, you know, it, there are so many different ways that people uh, historically have provided trust names, uh, and it's really important to pay attention to what Article 9 requires and follow that exactly. Uh, so when it comes to uh, trust-related uh, debtor name sufficiency, uh, I'm going to recap the general debtor name rules. One is the debtor name must strictly comply with Section 9503A. That's the section that sets out the debtor name requirements for all types of debtors. And uh, now it's important to understand that this section sets forth the debtor name for purposes of the financing statement, not necessarily for other purposes, such as for um, the uh, uh, the security agreement or the note and other things. Uh, bear in mind that any deviation from the correct name, even a comma out of place, means that it's not the name of the debtor. And uh, if it's not the name of the debtor, then um, it doesn't comply with Section 9503A and the financing statement will be seriously misleading under 9506B. This is a very high standard and there's a good reason for this and that's because Financing statements are retrieved by debtor name. So because of that, 
uh, if there are deviations in the debtor name, it may prevent a searcher from finding all the relevant records. Therefore, Article 9 has very strict requirements and requires uh, the strict compliance with those requirements or the debtor name will, be, uh, will make the record seriously misleading and not effective. Uh, there is an exception to that, though, and that is uh, under Section 9506C, if a search of the debtor's correct name uh, using the filing office's standard search logic would disclose the record, then an insufficient debtor name does not make the record seriously misleading. In other words, if you search the correct name and, it pop, and the financing statement shows up, um, it's effective, even though it might have uh, a deficiency in the name because it's not a hidden lien and there's no harm in making it effective. Um, however, Bear in mind that the search logic used by the vast majority of jurisdictions is very narrow and will not overlook many deviations in the name. Uh, the standard search logic that most states use will disregard minor uh, uh, differences in upper and lower case, punctuation, ending noise words like uh, uh, you know, ink, corporation, limited partnership, words, phrases, and abbreviations that indicate the type of entity. Uh, it'll disregard the at the beginning of the name and, and generally disregard spaces in most jurisdictions, uh, at least for organization names. If it's an individual name, the search logic isn't as forgiving. It, uh, does, there's a different search logic that's applied to the individual name fields. And the way that the search logic disregards, at least in an organization name, these different uh, factors is through a normalization process. When a financing statement is filed, the computer takes the name on the financing statement, makes it case neutral, it uh, strips out punctuation, it strips out ending noise words starting at the far end of the name and working back until it runs out of uh, ending noise words. It strips out the from the beginning of the name and finally removes spaces. And what you're left with is a string of text that is derived from the name on the financing statement. Now, when somebody conducts a search, this, the name searched is run through the same process, and that the normalized string resulting from the name searched is compared to the normalized names in the index, and only exact matches are reported at that point. So here's how it would work in practice. There's a financing statement out there that lists the debtors, the Harper Realty Trust, Gregory Gaudi is trust, or, uh, trustee. Well, the correct name uh, is the Harper Realty Trust. So if you normalize that name, it, uh, you'll see it normalizes to, the, to Harper Realty all one string of text because it drops the at the beginning and trust is an ending noise word. If you normalize the name on the financing statement, uh, trustee is an ending noise word, but Gaudi is not and uh, as a result, everything to the left of Gaudi will remain in there. And the two strings of text, uh, if you search under the Harper Realty Trust, the, it's not going to find uh, it, the, the resulting normalized string of text won't match uh, the financing statement string of text in the index. And because they do not match, the computer will not report it. Um, it's not the name of the debtor on the financing statement with the extra text, and the, uh, uh, the extra text will prevent the search logic from finding it. So it will render the financing statement seriously misleading and not effective. Now, the, the rules for common law trusts, anything other than a registered organization, is, uh, th those are found in Section 9503A3. And uh, it's one of the more detailed uh, name requirements in 9503, and we'll go through this, uh, uh, we'll break it down and go through it bit by bit. First, in section 9503A, uh, the finance, or 9503A3, I should say, the financing statement name requirements require uh, if the organic record of the trust specifies a name, uh, the name so specified. So it would be the name of the trust if a name is specified. But if no name is specified, then it would be the name of the settlor, or in the case of a testamentary trust, the testator. Uh, note that none of these are the name of the trustee, unless, of course, the trustee happens to be the settlor of an unnamed trust. 
the name of the trustee is not sufficient for purposes of Article 9, even though the trustee may in fact be the actual debtor. There are some additional uh, requirements uh, in uh, Section 9503A3 uh, if, in certain cases, if the name of the settlor is provided, uh, there must be some distinguishing information provided uh, for the trust to distinguish it from other trusts that uh, uh, have one or more of the same settlors or testators, and also an indication that the collateral is held in a trust. Now, these uh, additional requirements in Section 9503A3B are required for sufficiency of the record. These are debtor name requirements that are in addition to those uh, listed in 95502 for sufficiency of the record. In other words, without this additional information, the debtor name uh, arguably is not sufficient under Article 9. Well, let's look at the name of the trust. Uh, so the, the uh, 9503A3 uses the term specifies. Uh, specifies is a term used only in the trust section and not in any other debtor name section. Uh, so it ne needs the name specified in the organic record of the trust. Well, for a common law trust, that might be the declaration uh, or trust agreement. In a testamentary trust, it would be the last will and testament. Now, what does it mean to specify uh, the name? Well, uh, you know, we'll take a look at what the dictionary definition of specify is because it's, it's different than the term indicate uh, that's used elsewhere in the debtor name provisions. So it means to mention specifically, to state it in full and explicit terms, to point out, and uh, to state precisely or in detail, or to distinguish by words one thing from another. So it, it seems to ha be very particular. And uh, the source of this, by the way, was Black's Law Dictionary. So it, um, you know, the specify seems to require a certain degree of precision. So what does it mean to specify? Um, in, you, know, you could have a trust agreement that says something like the trust is known as something. Does that specify uh, what it's known as, or is uh, that something other than specify? Um, I think that the safest uh, assumption is that it's specified if it expressly states the name is something, much like you would see in Articles of Incorporation or Articles of Organization for an LLC. So it needs to be pretty specific. Uh, I, I'm, you know, if it's less than very clearly stated, uh, it falls into a gray area, and, and the filer may want to approach it both as if the name is specified and also uh, probably provide as additional debtors the name of the uh, uh, settlors. Um, there are a number of red flags that we can point out regarding the name of the trust. I mean, if, if a name is specified, that's the name that needs, needs to go on the record. Uh, simple as that. It needs to be exactly the name specified, nothing more, nothing less. But there are a lot of red flags we see when somebody's preparing a financing statement and they see any of these in the debtor name, they should go back and take a look and determine whether the, uh, the name of the trust is truly correct. Uh, for one thing, if it includes the word trustee, remember the name of the trustee is not sufficient as the name of the debtor. And if it uh, indicates that, uh, you know, the, the capacity that some name is provided in the capacity of trustee, that's not part of the name, uh, typically, and uh, probably would render the financing statement ineffective, or at least re render the name insufficient. Uh, if the name is so long that it's continued or referenced elsewhere, I have yet to see a properly provided name, even for a trust, that does not easily fit within uh, the space provided on a financing statement. If an agreement is listed as the debtor, that might be a red flag because an agreement is not what's uh, the name of an agreement is not required by Article 9. Rather, the name of the trust is required, not the name of the trust agreement. Um, abbreviations uh, generally are used to indicate certain abbreviations anyway are used to indicate uh, additional descriptive information, which might be helpful to distinguish the trust. But if it appears in a debtor name. Uh, is typically going to render the financing statement seriously misleading. Um, here's an example of, uh, I'll go through some examples of all of these. First of all, 
here we have uh, in the organization name of the trust uh, a couple of parties listed as trustees of a trust. Well, remember that the name of the trustee is not sufficient as the name of the debtor. Um, and uh, you know, capacity is typically not part of a debtor name anyway. Uh, there are uh, lots of other problems with this. First of all, even if the names of the trustees are required in their individual capacities, they would need to be listed as individual debtors. Um, and there is some discussion about that. I'll, I'll come back to that later. But um, the, uh, also, you have the trust dated a certain date. Unless that is specified as part of the name in the organic record, that would not be sufficient. So there's lots of problems with this one. Uh, here again, we have a, a name where it's providing the name of the trustee. Uh, remember, the name of the trustee is generally not sufficient as the name of the debtor. Also, individual names should be provided in the individual name fields because if they're going to be searched as individuals, that's where they show up. <clears throat> and it didn't include the name of a trust or the name of the settlor in this uh, particular record. So uh, the, name, the, the name required by Article 9 probably isn't anywhere on the record. Another red flag, uh, names that are so long that they have to be continued somewhere. You know, here, uh, for example, we have a, a, a lot of errors in this name as well, but they uh, provided um, uh, where to look for the continuation for the complete name. The problem is that whatever goes in the name field is going to be indexed exactly as it appears, and uh, that's what's going to wind up in the searchable index. So rather than the full name provided by the, uh, 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 the filer here, what goes in is going to be exactly what's in the name field. And if you go to the state and do a search and, and look, it's going to show up exactly as it appears there. And in fact, if uh, you know, this is the organization name field, and if somebody did uh, a search in the organization name field on the name of the trust, or the name of the settlor, they're never going to find this. It just isn't going to happen. Uh, here's another example. Uh, if it's too long to fit on one line, that should be a red flag. Here we have 458 characters. Um, in in the, the state where this was filed, uh, it can't even accommodate 458 characters. And the name, when, it's, uh, when it was indexed into the searchable index, was truncated to this. And uh, what makes it worse is that uh, the only unique identifier to the trust in this whole thing um, was at the very end and was truncated. So there, there was no way that anybody searching for trust number 315, even if that was the correct name of the trust, they, certain, they simply never would have been able to find it. Another uh, red flag, I mentioned that sometimes agreements get listed as the debtor. Here we have the Blaine 1977 Revocable Trust Agreement, um, at, helpfully adding in as amended. Um, problem is, the agreement is not the debtor. It's not the debtor name required by Article 9. Um, the amended portion is just descriptive text, wouldn't belong in a debtor name even if the first part of the um, name there was the correct debtor name. Here's another example. You know, they put in the, the name of the trust agreement. The name of the trust agreement is not sufficient as the name of the debtor under Article 9. Other red flags. I mentioned abbreviations such as for the benefit of, under trust agreement, uh, dated, uh, UAD under agreement dated. Uh, there, there are a lot of different abbreviations that find their way into uh, trust-related debtor names. All of these generally precede information that is intended to either uh, specify the uh, particular trust or distinguish the trust. None of these belong in a name field, typically. The only time they would go in a name field is if it's said in the organic record, the name of this trust is the James W. Campion III Trust under agreement dated, you know, that type of thing. Uh, if it's not specified in the organic record, it doesn't belong in the name field. So the best practices when it comes to providing the name of the trust, use the name specified in the organic record and provide it exactly as it is specified. Do not abbreviate or condense or add anything to the name. 
So omit anything that isn't part of the name, like the name of the trustee, the name of the beneficiary, unless these things are specified in the name of the trust. And I, you know, frankly, I don't think the date is generally specified as part of the name of the trust. Um, provide uh, if if the debt or if the uh, trust has a name specified in the organic documents, be sure to provide that name as an organization debtor name, even if the uh, uh, the actual uh, debtor is the trustee of the trust. Uh, this is important, uh, you know, because if the trustee is an individual, there there is some argument that. Uh, and, and by some very respected uh, commentators, that it needs to go into the field that corresponds to the nature of the debtor rather than to the nature of the name. I, I disagree with this um, because it can't be searched. There's no way to search it that way. So always provide the name of the debtor in the name of the or in the fields that correspond to the type of debtor. Now, once that's done, there is nothing wrong with also providing it in the as a separate debtor in the fields that correspond to the nature of the debtor. So if you have an individual debtor, the trustee, and you have a name specified for the trust, I suppose if somebody wanted to, uh, the first thing they need to do is get it in the name of the trust or in the organizational name of the trust, and then they could also, as a belt and suspenders approach, put it in the individual name field as well, but it could never be searched that way. Um, so that's a that's a good belt and suspenders approach. If there's any concern, uh, is do it both ways. Uh, if the name of the settlor or testator is required, um, that can be determined, um, you know, by the uh, by the organic record of the trust. Now, for a common law trust, the individual the uh, the settlor may be an individual or it could be an organization. So it's important to identify who the settlor is, and that, that can be determined from the organic record of the trust. Uh, if it's a testamentary trust, of course, it's always going to be an individual as the testator. Now, the, uh, there is a safe harbor in Article 9 under 9503H for the, in, for the name of the settlor or testator, and that would be the name uh, of, the, uh, of the party listed in the uh, organic record. However, if the, uh, if the settlor is a registered organization, then under uh, Article 9, the uh, registered organization rules would apply, uh, same as if the, uh, the settlor was a, a registered organization debtor in its own right. Um, but for any other uh, settlor or testator, it would be the name indicated in the trust's organic record. Now, when it comes to providing the name of the settlor, um, it's uh, really the same practices for an individual name because uh, the individual, uh, if the settlor is an individual, um, it, it can't be searched in an organization name field consistently. There, there might be no way to find it. So always put it in the individual name field. Uh, enter it as if that person is uh, a debtor in their own right. And um, you know, if there is a, a difference between the, you know, if the debtor is a, uh, actually the trust. Uh, an organization and the individual name is required, put the individual also as a belt and suspenders approach as a separate debtor in the organization name field. Now, if the, uh, if the settlor is an organization and has an organization name, always enter the organization name in the organization name field again. Um, and uh, this would be the case if the settlor is a registered organization, of course. But any name that isn't that of an individual needs to go in the organization name field. Again, uh, you can take the belt and suspenders approach if there's a difference between the, uh, uh, you know, an organization name and an individual debtor. Um, it's all, it, you know, it just removes all doubt. It makes it uh, uh, gives gives the filer a little bit of peace of mind. Now there are some common errors that are made in the name of the settlor. Uh, for example, one of them is indicating the capacity of the party as the settlor because um, indications of capacity are not part of a debtor name and should not be provided in the debtor name field because the search of CIBC Inc. is not going to find CIBC Inc. as settlor. Uh, actually, it won't find it 
in this case anyway, even because of all the additional stuff added to the end to clarify the uh, uh, you know what trust this is. Uh, we'll get to distinguishing information in a minute. So here we have uh, the indication of capacity. Um, you know, that should never be part of a debtor name unless it is part of the debtor name in the source document for the debtor name. Um, and including that descriptive information will prevent it from showing up on a search, and the string of text will not be that of the name of the debtor. Here we have much the same type of situation. We have an individual settlor name provided in the organization name field. Uh, there was not one a corresponding name in the or, in the individual name field either. They have also included uh, an indication of capacity and um, you know more information about the uh, the trust agreement and the date. Uh, all of this extra information uh, should have been omitted. It does not um, it, it is not part of the name of the debtor typically, and um, will just render it seriously misleading and not effective. It, should be provided in a different part of the financing statement. Now here somebody has provided uh, the name of the trustee um, and uh, they've also provided the name of the trust in the individual name fields. They've provided uh, uh, both the middle name and last name in the uh, middle name field, or the middle initial and last name. Uh, again, all this extra information in the name will prevent it from showing up even if the right person to search was Elizabeth uh, Stepanian. So how, do, how does one avoid trust-related name errors? Number one, don't add ever anything to a debtor name. Uh, you know, any, any additional information that needs to be provided must be provided in a separate part of the financing statement. Uh, don't provide the name of the trustee, or at least indicate that you know, the trustee may be the, the uh, party that has to be listed if they're the trustee of an unnamed, uh, also the set law of an unnamed trust. But don't include the indication of capacity that they're in there as trustee or as settlor. So never indicate capacity in the name unless it's part of the name in the source document. And uh, this is a trap. Do not invent a name for the trust. If a name isn't specified, uh, the na there may not be a name for the trust. Um, if, if a name isn't clearly specified, uh, you know, if, if there is a name that might be specified, yeah, go ahead and provide that as an additional debtor, but go ahead then and also provide the name of the settlor. Um, do not uh, invent a name for the trust where none is specified in the organic record, uh, at least without also providing uh, alternative names of the settlor who, uh, uh, or other names that might be required under Article 9. Now, I mentioned that when providing the name of the settlor or testator, there's additional information required to distinguish uh, the, tr the trust involved uh, where the, that holds the collateral from one or more other trusts with the same settlor or settlors. Now this distinguishing information um, must be provided in a separate part of the financing statement. Do not provide it in the, in the debtor name. It must be in a separate part of the financing statement. Uh, so how does one identify the uh, uh, trust to distinguish it? Well, best practice is to do what many people have done in the debtor name fields. Just do it in a different part of the financing statement. Identify the specific trust, uh, maybe citing the agreement and the, and the date, uh, a little bit of explanation for um, you know, what, the, uh, what the relation to the uh, debtor name that's provided uh, is, and uh, uh, and then provide it on the financing statement somewhere other than in the uh, debtor name field. So remember, do not provide it as part of the debtor name. That distinguishing information is not part of the debtor name. It must be in a separate part of the financing statement, and that's part of the statutory requirement. So how to provide it? One option is to use the addendum. Uh, item 17 of the addendum form uh, can be used for this purpose. It's called the miscellaneous field. Um, and uh, here the, uh, uh, it can explain the information to uh, distinguish it from other trusts. But there are a couple other options and probably more. Another common option that's used is to uh, provide it in the collateral field either on the financing statement or on the addendum. And that can look something like this, where you know all assets uh, of the debtor, 
and then explain how the debtor name is provided and maybe provide additional information about the trustee uh, if, if it wasn't uh, already provided uh, in full on the, uh, in the debtor fields. You can, you can provide additional information in the debtor address field. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then finally, another option is to uh, include um, uh, an uh, exhibit uh, that's referenced in the uh, collateral field, and, uh, such as Exhibit A. Uh, here they can provide all the whole background of the debtor, uh, you know, the names of the trustees, the history of the trustees, um, the name of the trust, dates, and things like that. That can all be done as an exhibit. Just don't provide it in the name of the or in the name of the debtor. Have it in a separate part of the financing statement. All of this information is very helpful to have, but not in the debtor name. Um, the financing statement must also indicate that the collateral is held in a trust. That indication is required regardless of the type of name that's provided. Um, the easiest way to do it is to use a checkbox, but it can be included uh, if, if in the additional information used to distinguish from other trusts. Um, it, does, it, it, does not, it is not made in the debtor name field. Uh, it specifically says, in a separate part of the financing statement. So technically, even if the name says the ABC Trust, that doesn't that's not a sufficient indication. It needs to be made in a separate part of the financing statement. Uh, so you can't make it in the debtor name. Best practice, always use the checkbox in item 5 of the UCC1 form or its electronic equivalent, and there's a nice handy checkbox there to indicate that the collateral is held in a trust. The financing statement must provide a mailing address for the debtor. Um, the, end of the uh, mailing address, uh, just in general, um, financing statements must provide a, a mailing address for the debtor. Um, but Article 9 is, is very lenient on what can be provided. There is no single mailing address. Uh, it can be any one of several mailing addresses for the debtor. Uh, there is no specified format for the address. It can be a street address. It can be a P.O. box. Um, so that, you know, there's different ways to provide an address. Um, but it has to be a mailing address for the debtor. So uh, if there is no address on there, by the way, it doesn't render the financing statement seriously misleading. It's only there to avoid rejection under Article 9. So when it comes to a trust-related address, the mailing address uh, is going to be for the debtor, not for the debtor name. In other words, uh, it, it's a mailing address for the debtor. If the debtor is the trustee, it should be the trustee's mailing address. If the debtor is the trust under applicable state law, it should be the trust's mailing address. Uh, so bottom line, it's, it should be a mailing address where the, where, um, the debtor can be reached. Uh, so if it's the trust, it's the address of the trust. If, it, if the debtor is the trustee, it's the address of the trustee or trustees. There may be multiple trustees, and it may be necessary to uh, have multiple mailing addresses on there, which can be added using an exhibit or um, possibly added at the, uh, uh, in the collateral. Um, the address may include uh, distinguishing information in most states. Um, there are some filing offices that may reject if it's not purely in a, um, a U.S. Postal Service format, but uh, generally you can put information in there, such as a care of uh, in the mailing address street. And here we have care of uh, John O'Shirk, trustee, uh, indicating capacity. These are all perfectly fine in the mailing address in um, most jurisdictions. Now it's important to make sure that these are filed in the correct location. Location is going to depend uh, on the governing law, and that's going to depend on the location of the debtor. So it's necessary to begin by looking at the law that's going to govern perfection and priority of the um, particular transaction, and that's going to be the law of the debtor's location, unless it's fixtures, timber, or minerals. Uh, if the trust is a registered organization, it's going to be where it was formed or organized. That's where the, the law will govern perfection and priority. If the trust is not a registered organization, uh, then the location is going to depend on uh, you know, the nature of the trust. Is it, 
Is the trust the debtor or is the trustee the debtor? Uh, so that's going to depend on the applicable state law. If the trust is the debtor, determine the trust's place of business. Does it have a, a physical place of business where it carries on its affairs? Uh, or does it have more than one place of business, in which case it would be its chief executive office for the trust? If the trustee is the debtor, then it would be um, the location. Then it would be the location of the trustee. So, if the trustee is a registered organization, then uh, generally it's going to be the state of organization. Uh, if the individual, if the trustee is an individual, it'd typically be the location of the individual's principal residence. Um, if for any other type of organization trustee. Uh, it would generally be their place of business, or if they have more than one place of business, the chief executive office. Um, the, within the state where the debtor is located, uh, it's necessary to look at Section 9501 to determine where to file the general rule. Uh, once you've located the the uh, uh, locate, or once you've determined the location of the trust or the trustee, you file in the central filing office of the state where the trust or trustee is located unless it's fixtures, timber, or minerals. Now one thing I want to point out here, it is possible to have uh, uh, trustees of the debtor that are located in multiple jurisdictions, and in that case it may be necessary to file in more than one jurisdiction uh, just to be safe. Likewise, if it's questionable under applicable state law whether the debtor is a trust or a trustee, file everywhere. Uh, just be on the safe side. There's, there's no uh, no harm in doing that. 